Um, so it's great to have Neville here. He was um, one of the founding members of the Reason um, Consortium and group, um, and then decided it was much more sensible to take uh, retirement. So he is now an em emeritus professor um, in the Transportation Research Group at the University of Southampton, and is going to be talking to us today about um, some of his work that's developed and applied a method to help understand resilience. Um, and hopefully we can learn a bit more about how we can apply that to trustworthy autonomous systems. So thank you very much, Neville, and over to you. Great, thanks, Katie. Uh, it's delightful to be back involved in the Reason project, albeit briefly, but here we go. Uh, let's see if I can find the front of this presentation. There we go. So, Okay, so what I wanted to talk about today was an idea that I've been playing around with for uh, a, sh a while now, uh, which is looking at um, socio-technical systems as networks. And I believe this approach has some application to the idea of understanding um, and predicting how resilient systems are, or indeed looking back at incidents and accidents and deciding where uh, resilience for failures lie. So really that's, that's the idea. And um, I'm hoping that uh, somebody will be inspired by this talk and want to pursue it further. Uh, Cause I've got limited opportunities now I'm retired. Anyway, so the talk will cover my view on what social technical systems are and the underpinning theory that I've been using and developing for my approach on this, and the method that I've uh, ah, pioneered. Ah, hello, Sharma. Hello. The method I've pioneered <laughs> called EAST, Event Analysis Systemic Teamwork, and then uh, how you can use this to look back at instance and look forward to make predictions. Um, so the, Essentially, the idea is you have these models that you can use to find out what went wrong or predict what might go wrong. And then I've got summarize at the end um, what I think further developments of this approach could be. So um, just my always starting slide is to say I've been involved in methods development in the field of human factors engineering. And some of those books have even made it into second edition. And no doubt there are books on East, which I will point to as we go along. So my sort of view of what social technical systems analysis is about is about understanding the stuff that's going on in between in that dotted line, the system context and boundaries. So how people interact with each other, how they interact with technology and how they interact with each other through technology. And things we tend to do in the field is we manipulate Things that are on the left, like task structure, team structure, interfaces, automation, degrees of, job aids, feedback, and so on. And then we measure the stuff that's on the right hand, workload, awareness, trust, decisions, communications, and so on. So that's what the world of human factors is about um, in, from my perspective. And if you look at the center stuff the, between the system context and boundaries, that begins to look a bit like a network. And that's really uh, described the approach that I've taken to try and understand what is going on in socio-technical systems. And alongside that, I've also been developing my own sort of theory, theory of socio-technical systems, which is called distributed situation awareness. And this has a number of tenets associated with it. And I think that um, helps me think about you know what it is I'm trying to do in when I'm designing or analyzing or understanding um, systems. So the first thing is we think of situation awareness as an emergent property. It comes out of the interaction between the system elements. Um, we think that awareness is distributed across human and non-human agents within a system. That idea that awareness is held by non-human agents is quite controversial in human factors. Uh, but I think it's entirely fitting, particularly with animate objects, um, such as vehicle automation. Um, that systems have a dynamic network of agents uh, upon of, of information, uh, sorry, dynamic network of information upon which different agents have their own perspective. 
So the perspective held by the vehicle will be very different to the perspective held by the human driver, for example. Um, the awareness in the system is maintained by the transactions between the agents, between the, when they're making exchanges. So you're issuing a command or receiving information from the system you're interacting with. That's a, a transaction. And I believe it's compatible essay that is the key to success of these systems. So that although you may not have identical or shared essay, at very least it's compatible. That means at the boundaries, it connects together. Um, I believe that genotype and phenotype schema have a role to play. So I believe it's underpinned by schema theory of which uh, Katie Plant is, is something of an expert in. Um, and that plays a role in those transactions. So it sets up the expectations about what you think is going on, the, the underlying schema. And the schema has a phenotype, which is the schema built up in the dynamic interactions. I also believe these dynamical uh, changes in system coupling may be associated with changes in SA. Um, and this suggests that the coupling of um, systems is not fixed. It, it can go from very loose coupling to very tight coupling. The examples normally given in the literature for a loosely coupled system is a university, because they just pretty free to get on whatever they want to do, but they are somehow connected. And a very tightly coupled system, normally the example given in the literature is a nuclear power plant. Uh, but I think in most socio-technical systems, the coupling is dynamic and it can move between tight and loose coupling. The, the spectrum of movement might be different per, depending on the domain, of course. And finally, that one agent uh, may, may compensate for degradation in another SA agent. So indeed the car could alert you to an impending collision that you were previously unaware, unaware of and therefore um, guide your, your um, regaining of control of the vehicle, for example. Okay, so that's the sort of theory dry bit done with, if you like. So that's led me on to try and build up networks of systems using this method. And essentially we're trying to build three different networks and then uh, look at the relationship between those networks as well as within those networks. So the very first thing we have is a task network, which is a description of the uh, tasks and their interrelations. Uh, the social network is the agents, human and non-human, and their uh, connectedness. And then the information network is the way the information is connected uh, together in a network uh, um, to perform those tasks uh, as uh, uh, with those agents. And so not only are we interested in those networks by themselves, but we're interested in the relationships between those networks. So task networks related to information networks. So how is information distributed amongst tasks? Similarly, how tasks are distributed amongst the agents. And that may be dynamic. There may be dynamic allocation of function that may not be fixed. And then how that information is communicated and used by those agents uh, to perform those tasks. Um, we are building models, so we have to accept that all models are wrong, but I'm arguing these are useful models, uh, which is a nod to um, uh, George there. So what do we do with these, these models? Well, right at the top there, you've got a, the top of that hierarchy, you've got the uh, triangular hierarchy. You've got the network as I've described it. And on the left, bottom left, you've got, we can use these networks to look back to understand which nodes have failed in, 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 in um, incidents and accidents. And the example I'm gonna give you is the Uber collision uh, with the pedestrian. <clears throat> And we can also, bottom right, we can also make predictions about how systems might fail in the future. And I've got an example from a case study that I was involved in um, some years ago, uh, which is a Hawk frigate case study, which I'll go into detail later. So hopefully that all makes sense. So just to, when people talk about communication structures, or any kind of network structures. Uh, there's normally some reference to the basic archetypes, which you can see here. 
Um, so moving left to right, we've got the chain where all the agents, task or information connected together in a, a simple chain. The Y network, self-explanatory, a circle, they're all connected together with only one, uh, one connection going to two other nodes in a circle. A wheel where you have a central node connected to separate nodes and then an all connected where everything is connected to everything else. Um, and the argument goes that all networks are made up of hybrids of these basic uh, network structures. Uh, there are many other types, but these are the sort of five basic ones. And this is quite interesting little um, thought experiment. If you understand, if you think about these uh, networks in front of you as agents, say, and the red dot as the information uh, being communicated between the agents. Because very, a very simple demonstration can show you that actually, depending on the network type, the information can take um, more or less time depending on the network structure. The other thing about that is you can begin to see that some networks might be easier to disrupt than others, or put it another way, some networks might be more resilient than others. So for example, the all-connected network is often, of, often uh, given as an example of a very resilient network to disruption, whereas the chain is not very resilient, for example. Um, the other idea I have is that um, all accidents <laughs> or events are um, due to a failure to communicate information between agents or tasks. And in front of you, I've got the uh, Held a Free Enterprise, uh, which was the ship that capsized, the roll on a roll of ferry that capsized at Zabrugger. And uh, the here, the, uh, the captain was not aware that the bow doors were open when he set sail. So, you know, I'm, I'm accepting that no uh, event is a single uh, point of failure, but for the purposes of illustration of this talk, you can see the failure to communicate to the captain, the bow doors are open, it certainly um, played a part in the capsizing of this ferry. So floating out into a choppy sea with his bow doors open, allowing water to enter onto the decks. Another example is the uh, British Midland aircraft that crashed at um, the e just before the East Midlands Airport. It wasn't very far from the runway, but crashed on the motorway, as you can see here. Um, and again, this is an example where information failed to reach the pilots. The information about which engine was actually on fire. So they shut down the good engine and um, consequently the aircraft plummeted short of the runway and you can see broke into three large pieces. And finally, the uh, Labrook Grove accident, uh, where the train driver went past a red signal, a signal of danger where he should have halted, brought the train to a halt, but he didn't. In fact, the uh, black box records from the train on board recorder show that in fact, at that point, he actually accelerated. So that you could argue that the information about uh, that it was dangerous to proceed, he should stop, uh, didn't reach the train driver and um, uh, unfortunately and fatefully uh, crashed into an oncoming high-speed train. So um, I try to claim in a, in, a, in a general paper that all accidents and near misses are caused by the failure to communicate information between agents and tasks. Peer review made me, uh, watered me down somewhat and said most, if not all, accidents and near misses are caused, at least in part, by the failure to communicate information between agents and stars. But that's, that's essentially the thesis of this talk. So, um, I just want to give you a quick demonstration. I'll whiz through this quite quickly about what these different networks look like. Um, so remember, we're talking about the task information and um, social networks and the um, combined network where it's, they're all put together as a model of the system. Uh, so for this example, I was working closely with the Royal Navy and I was trying to describe the uh, activities involved in bringing a submarine to periscope depth. <clears throat> 
And in these pictures, you can see me in various positions on the uh, astute submarine, which is pictured in the top left. So I was actually on board a real submarine, which is a whole bunch of fun. Um, anyway, and we also built ourselves at Southampton a submarine control room simulator, which you see pictured in front of you. Uh, but this, this study was based on data we collected from a training simulator. So this is a, a simulator of a submarine control room um, <clears throat> somewhere in Portsmouth and uh, where we collected data and then we use that data to build these networks. Uh, and the network, the data we got looks very like this. So we got data about um, who was talking to whom in their protocols. They have to say who they want to speak to and who they are. And then they follow that with the, um, the content of what they want to communicate to that person. Uh, all the data was timed. Uh, you can see recorded time, uh, then mission time, then who spoke, uh, who they wanted to speak to, then who spoke, and then the information. And then some of the information has been crossed out because it's um, <clears throat> obviously sensitive. But this data enabled us to compile these networks. So the very first thing we do was compile a social network, which you can see in front of you now. And this basically just says who's communicating uh, with whom. And you can see the various positions there, we don't have to worry about them. But you can see between sound control and OPSO, there's quite a lot of communications. And between OOW, that's Office of the Watch, and Ships Control, again, quite a lot of com um, communications. But uh, you also can describe this network in terms of the global metrics, which are up there, nodes, edges, diameter, density, and cohesion. And that actually is some measures of resilience, I believe, those, those global network measures. Uh, density and diameter go between zero and one. You can see density is a sort of medium density, about 0.4. Cohesion is quite low, 0.2. And you can also um, have uh, nodal metrics associated with each of those agents in the network, which are described there. Just a couple of things to point out here. If you look at the sociometric status of the captain. Um, it's quite low compared to that of the officer watch and the OPSO. So arguably, you might argue, in terms of the communication structure, the captain is not the most important person on the uh, uh, deck of the submarine. Uh, now the sort of eureka moment here is realizing we can do exactly the same with task networks. So we can describe ta task networks in terms of their density and cohesion. And we can represent them in this way, which you see in front of you. Um, and this is, describes all the tasks associated with getting that submarine from what they call safe depth to um, performing its mission at periscope depth. Uh, one thing you might notice is uh, detecting close contacts, um, it, it, all the points when they're ascending, if they detect close contacts, then they they uh, they return to post they return to safe depth. So again, with those nodal metrics, we can see that detecting close contacts, uh, if you can see that on that table, is um, uh, one of the most important um, uh, 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 nodes in that network because if you if there's something in, uh, closing on the submarine, uh, you on on when you're uh, ascending, there's an opportunity to collide with it. It's something you don't want to do. Um, and the information network is quite uh, busy, um, but this is from the from the comms. This is all the information that they were using to get them up to periscope depth, and we've simplified it for the purpose of this analysis, as you can see there. But quite low density, quite low cohesion, and again. Um, the most important information on that uh, in that network is identifying contacts, which is similar to the uh, task network. Now, the interesting thing here is we can look at those networks in combination. So we can call it PhD coloring, but we can color code the uh, tasks by who's performing them as done there. 
Uh, we can look at the information and social network together so we can color code who's using that information as shown in that network there. And it's more about ownership of key concepts. And also we can look at the task network and information network together so we can group the information network by the tasks that uh, information is being used for. And finally, we can look at the whole thing together. And so here we've got the information network color coded by the agents, the actors, and groups by the tasks. So that's your sort of multimodal network there. So that's, that's how we go about modeling um, the world in East, if you like. So now I want to consider how we go back and investigate you know, an, an incident. So the, uh, we call this uh, actually broken nodes. Let's put, put the wrong notation there. It should be East BN for collision analysis, broken nodes analysis. And this I looked at because I'd already done a project looking at this, um, this case study. So I understood it in some detail. So those that don't know, the, um, <clears throat> there was, uh, they were testing the Uber, uh, an Uber vehicle, automated driving vehicle in temper, and it was in autonomous mode and it collided with a pedestrian. But supposedly there was a safety operator in the vehicle who was there to uh, intervene uh, if the vehicle behaved in a way it didn't do. Unfortunately, she didn't. She looked up about uh, half a second before the collision and spotted the pedestrian far too late to intervene. Uh, we know from the black box in the vehicle that <clears throat> it took three goes for the system to identify um, it as a pedestrian willing a bicycle in front of them. And, and then it called on emergency braking to intervene, automatic emergency braking. That system had been disabled, so it didn't, uh, it didn't intervene in time. We know the pedestrian was crossing in front of the path of the vehicle. And this is a daytime view of that road. And there was actually a um, sign telling the pedestrian not to cross, but it was dark and the sign wasn't lit. And we know a lot of people use this as a crossing path, even though there's a crosswalk for further up the road that they should have used. And jaywalking is illegal in the United States of America. So looking at the task network, we can see that uh, quite a lot of things failed here. So uh, the pedestrian appeared not to have read the signage. Um, they appeared not to find a safe place to cross the road, which there was uh, a few hundred yards away. And they appeared not to have checked the road for traffic. Um, the driver wasn't provided any warnings and they weren't we know from video footage they weren't monitoring the road in front, they're looking down inside the vehicle. Um, so all those tasks failed. From the social network point of view, um, it appeared the pedestrian and the uh, road sign hadn't, hadn't connected. Uh, the automatic emergency braking system was called upon but was disabled, so therefore didn't invoke the brakes. Um, so we noticed some problems with the social network and the information network, or we know information about emergency braking and detection of obstacles wasn't working properly. We knew the system took some time to classify. Uh, the pedestrian got it right on the third attempt. And we know the pedestrian didn't read the signage. Um, so those, those were sort of failures in the information network. So um, looking at sort of what insights do we get from that? Well, we know that from that model of the network that we built, it appears nine out of the 16 and those were broken in the task network, five out of the 19 uh, nodes were broken in the social network, and eight out of the 26 uh, nodes appear to be broken in the information network. So we know from the, from the task network the person didn't read the sign or find a safe place to cross nor check the road for traffic. Uh, we know the vehicle didn't monitor the driver's alertness nor provide them with warnings when they need to take manual control. And then we know that driver wasn't monitoring the driving environment. Um, <clears throat> and we know the behavior of the vehicle, um, you know, there was no manual takeover uh, before the collision. Uh, and from the social network, we know the pedestrian didn't obey the no crossing sign, but we know the non-crossing sign itself was small and unlit. And we know that uh, the, the vehicle didn't brake because the automatic emergency braking system had been disabled. 
Um, from the information network, we know that, um, well, I've said it before, but they didn't use the information from the signage to cross Furbrook Road. And we also know that there are problems with the vehicle automation classifying a pedestrian. Uh, it took three goes. And we know when the obstacle was detected, A, B couldn't be evoked. And also we know that the driver, well, it's alleged by the police of Tempo that the, from the data they got from the phone company, that the uh, <clears throat> driver, oh, sorry, vehicle safety operator, not driver, um, had not had been not attending to the road environment. Um, up, they've been watching the voice on their phone, it, it is alleged, and very late to detect the pedestrian in the path of vehicle. We know from video footage, they looked up about half a second before the pedestrian was run over. So that's the sort of looking back approach with the East, <clears throat> the broken nodes approach. And the looking forward approach um, is trying to build a model of the system and kind of predict uh, what will go wrong if you break the links. Uh, this case study is based on the uh, HMS Sheffield. Um, well, not based on this, this, it was inspired, the study was inspired by HMS Sheffield, uh, which we, on the 4th of May, May 1982, you may know we were at war with Argentina. They tried to claim the Falklands. So we decided to go in and rescue the penguins. Um, and on the 4th of May, 1982, uh, HMS Sheffield was struck by an Exocet missile. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this was a sea skimming missile, French, I believe, in origin, but it was launched by an Argentinian aircraft. Um, fortunately, it didn't explode. It struck the fuel tanks and the fuel tanks uh, were set alight, but the missile didn't explode. So fortunately, only 20 people died, but you know, still fairly tragic. Um, but the outcome of this was that the uh, Navy was severely criticised for the training procedures in their detection of sea skimming missiles and something had to be done about it. So in response to that, their training became uh, flying hawks 50 feet above the sea to, um, and a hawk looks like this, hawk aircraft, uh, flying that 50 feet above the sea. So it would simulate a missile approach. And then they'd look to see how quickly they could detect it on board the frigate and take evasive action. Um, so flying these things at 15 feet above the sea is a pretty skilled task. I've had a go in a simulator and crashed, uh, although I'm not a pilot. Um, but I'm told that on a flat calm sea, it's virtually impossible to judge 50 feet. On a choppy sea, it's much easier. These hawk craft for various reasons don't have rad out and the pressure barometers they use are very inaccurate at such a low level. So it's quite a risky task. So we were asked to sort of use that as a case study, modeling that risk um, in a, using a socio-technical system method. So we used EAST. So here we have left to right, the task network, far left, middle, center, the social network and right, the information network. Now these were built up based on uh, workshops with experts. We did not have uh, access to live footage or any kind of um, communications or simulation or anything. It was literally a couple of workshops and we built these networks up and they said, yeah, that's good enough sort of thing. So I built those networks up and, th and then we, looked at the composite network to understand ownership of information, how, it, how the information related to tasks and how information related to, to, social, to the uh, network agents, as you can see in that picture there. So the colors are that for the different um, agents and the grouping uh, in the background is, are the tasks. And then to look at the identify risk, what we did was uh, break the links for the information for the task and social networks to show that in, if this information couldn't reach, couldn't be passed from one agent to another agent or from one task 
to another task, what would the risk be to the system? That is essentially what we did. So it is a sort of break link um, approach uh, to identify the risks in that, in that in that system. So what we do, you go uh, produce tables like this, so you've got the from agent to the to agent, the information not communicating, what the resulting risk is, and then what the mitigation strategy might be to try and reduce that risk. So you do that for the social networks, so all the links which you get from your composite network. And then similarly, we did exactly the same from to, and but for the information not communicated for the tasks, resultant risk, and then mitigation strategy. And from that, we were able to identify, <clears throat> so we broke 19 social links and 12 task links to identify 137 potential risks of the system. Uh, and some examples of which are variability in which the pilots will report back to the duty holder. So if they've encountered something that they perceive to have been um, uh, a risk to life, uh, they're supposed to report it back. But I think what the modeling suggested was that different pilots might have different levels of risk tolerance, for example. Also, perhaps the more interesting findings were the crew on the frigate need to train against sea skimming missiles, which appear later on radar and require short response time. So the higher the risk, higher the hawk flies, the safer it is for the pilot of the hawk, but the earlier the identification the frigate will get that there's an incoming simulated missile. Um, and so for their purposes, for their training, you want the hawk to be as low as possible to give them late detection to see how quickly they can respond to late detection. However, for the pilot of the hawk, using his eye, the eyes to, of the wave to judge the height cue of the aircraft, uh, the lower he flies, the more risk to him, and the higher he flies, the less risk to him, for example. Anyway, those are the sorts of things that we came up with uh, for them to consider. I mean, ideally, you'd fit rad out to the aircraft. I think it costs a million pounds and uh, you allow your hawks to fly a bit lower. Um, and indeed, uh, one of the reasons that this study was commissioned was they have had a few what they call, uh, um, well, they use a phrase they use, an interesting phrase they use, it's something like, uh, well, it's a bit like when you skim a stone across the water, they bounce off the, off, off the water, which creates damage to the end and the carriage, no doubt. Anyway, so that's, um, those are the two, the three methods, the East method model as a standard model of a system performing its function, then looking back to identify what nodes failed, and looking forward to identify if particular links fail, what risks arise in the system. But um, this is a work in progress uh, and there's a number of problems with it as it stands, I think. So we've only looked at the failure to transfer information. Uh, but what if the wrong information is communicated? Um, and, you know, one clear example in my mind, because I'm old enough, I suppose, is the Three Mile Island incident where they were told that a particular valve was shut, but it wasn't. Uh, and they acted as though that information was correct, but it was wrong. So I can see uh, potential development to look at wrong information communicated. Um, I, I wonder if that makes any difference, you know, do, does in terms of understanding the risk, if the wrong information is communicated, and would it change the mitigation strategy? But I still think it's, that's probably an interesting thing to pursue. The other thing I'm very well aware of, particularly speaking to this audience, is all the models are like pictures, they're static. And you might even not even call them models in your discipline, you might just call them pictures. And I do feel there's an opportunity to look at um, making these models dynamic. And that may be able to enable you to explore um, the breaking of links in real time or faster than real time, but actually seeing a physical change in the network. 
Um, so that people who are into, into dynamic modeling might see opportunities there, I think. Um, another thing I'm acutely aware of, given we're talking about social technical systems, is um, I've only made one thing fail at a time in these, because they're in, they're in um, tables, Excel tables. So what you break, you say, this information doesn't pass to this, from this agent to this agent, or from this task to this task. What's the outcome for the system? It's not looking at multiple failures in systems. And typically what you find in most incidents and accidents is there's been more than one failure. And the, there's a concatenation of failures. So you might get technical failures followed by human failures and then coming together, both in parallel and series. And maybe you need the dynamic modeling to show that. But I do think there's this problem in human factors, pictures, we like to call them models, but pictures. But, you know, we've got explaining that concatenation of failure. Although in those pictures, I have had multiple, looking back in the Uber incident, we did show that multiple things failed, but there's no, there's no time series to that. Um, and I also think once you've, if you are making changes to the, to the model, then you have to remodel it. So there is this, I know in modeling, there is this approach called model break model. Uh, and I think in the human factors, well, we haven't got that far. We've got model break and then what's, then looking, scratching heads, okay, what's the, what's the consequence for the system? But really then you need to go and remodel it and say, actually, has that made it any better? Um, there has been work where we've compared uh, different models of the system and, say, and said, which is, which is the better model. But I think this model based model approach, particularly with dynamic modeling, would be really interesting to do. And I think it's definitely a, a way I'd like to see it go further. Yeah, we, so this is a paper where we sort of talked about this approach where we take this task social and knowledge networks, produce a composite network, um, break the links and then look at the reconfigured network and then see that itself needs to be tested. So that's really what I've been talking about. Anyway, this is one of my favorite uh, quotes. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Uh, certainly that is the case in human factors. If we could predict the future, we'd be very, very rich. Uh, if any of this has sparked any interest in anybody? I hope one or two people are, it's uh, it felt a spark of interest there. We, in August, we've got a book coming out called Handbook of Systems Thinking Methods, which is the very much a human factors perspective. And two of those chapters are specifically talking about the East approach. Uh, but there are, you know, many other uh, modeling approaches in human factors as contained in this book. Um, so if you are at all interested, it does come out in, in August. And that's me pretty much finished. So I'll stop sharing, see if anybody's still awake. There's still a few people awake. All the people were there. Screens off, I assume are fast asleep by now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Neville, either. Real claps or virtual claps, whatever you want. Thanks, Neville. <laughs> that was really interesting. Um, so we'll open it up to questions now. I know that um, Bashir's already put one in the chat. Do you want to do you want to do that one now? In do you want to ask it or do you want me to read it out? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to ask it. Oh, okay, great. Can you hear me there? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Neville. That was really really fascinating, really interesting. Um, it's it's really more to just to get your thoughts. I I was just wondering. Um, given that our project is on resilience, there was a sort of an implicit definition there that resilience is somehow um, an ability of a system to, to, to cope with, prevent, or maybe uh, recover from, from kind, of, kind of failure. And, and a lot of the examples you gave were couched as example where stuff happens and then something goes wrong, a failure happens, hmm. things explode, things crash, an accident happens. And I'm just wondering whether also there's an alternative view or a different view or an additional view where 
where failure isn't quite a point in time, there's an atrophy of a system, system performance stuff starts to happen and it's not performing as, as well as it should. And, and in a sense, we, we can't detect whatever detection might mean that, that failure. And then correspondingly, resilience is not about fixing it in, in, as such, but it's about learning and adapting and strengthening and sort of slowly then coming to a point where in time where, where, where the system is now behaving in a different way. And so I was wondering whether that was compatible with your view of modeling these networks in terms of tasks or whether, you know, whether, whether task was sufficient granularity to be able to model these systems. Um, I think you, you mentioned dynamism at the end, and I was wondering you know, that it could relate to that, but I just was, was curious to hear your thoughts about that. I suppose uh, I probably should have said it out loud. My implicit, <laughs> my implicit definition of resilience for the purposes of this talk were that it was a degradation in the networks, the socio-technical network degradation. Um, was my kind of definition of, of resilience or lack of. So I was saying that you, you may fail to detect links or nodes breaking to a point unless, unless it tips over and becomes an event that has you know, noticeable outcomes, normally catastrophic, but you, know, you kill somebody or whatever, or, or the machine or the, or the aircraft crashes or whatever. So, so I think a lot of these networks can run suboptimally without, with, without, an, without an obvious adverse outcome, but, but they can also fail critically. And, and I, I, think, I think resilience on those terms is like, a, is like a, a spectrum. So you can have it, it could be very resilient to, to failure and, or, and it become less so as nodes and links drop out uh, uh, but it can still function it can still perform its function just suboptimally up to a point and, and, and at a certain point there might be a certain uh, combination of nodes and links that fail that then it tips over and is no longer performing at all and, and might we be able to have a measure of resilience that is also but it's not in a sense it's a property of this system a, a, about where it is on that spectrum, perhaps. Well, I was hinting that those global and noble metrics, okay. probably too subtly, might be a measure of resilience of the system. Okay. Now, now I think that has to be born. That there needs to be a. a it, it can't be taken that the higher the value, the global metric, for example, if you take density, for example, that's a nice simple metric density, zero okay. to one. Oh, if, if it's zero, nothing's connected, the system has obviously failed. But just because it's at one, that may actually be suboptimal because that's an all connected network. And all connected networks mean you've got to, you've got to tell everybody everything, which in terms of my view of situation awareness is suboptimal because people then can't tell the wheat from the chaff. What's the important information? So, so actually, and I've sort of expressed this somewhere else, Somewhere in the middle, the density of around about 0.5 might be a better, a, a better, uh, a, a more resilient, um, a better, a better indicator of, of good resilience for a, for a network than either one or zero. <laughs> so, but I'm thinking it's probably multi-dimensional. You've got lots of different measures there, like cohesion, like sociometric state, you know, global and 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 nodal metrics. I don't know what the answer is. I, I think that's, re that's really interesting. I mean, I guess the, the nearest equivalent would be to insecurity where there's either an attack or there isn't one, mm -hmm. but sometimes there's just grounds for suspicion. Mm -hmm. Something may or may not be happening, but mm -hmm. the trajectory is that you are heading towards something that's undesirable. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that there that might be a really interesting link there between trying to understand the notion of suspicion and the notion of degradation. Well, probably more interesting if it could be done would be to dynamically model these networks and look how those metrics change over time because if they're if they remain stable that might be that might that might be if you could if you could if you could corroborate the evidence that might be that the system is resilient because it's maintaining stability if those if those network metrics are changing dramatically that might be an indication that, that it, the system's adapting but it might also be an indication the system is beginning 
is moving towards failure. Uh, again, I don't know what the answer is. I'm afraid there's more questions than answers in this talk. But I'm... Thanks, Sasha, for your questions. Yeah. Um, hopefully, the Southampton PhD student will help answer some of these because they're going to be looking at method, the best sort of human factors methods for resilience. So I think they'll definitely be building on some of Neville's um, sort of questions that have not been answered yet. Um, I'm going to go to Radu, and then there's a couple of questions in the chat, and then back to Poonam. So Radu, I saw your hand up first. Thank you very much for the interesting talk, uh, Neville. So uh, the, the question that comes to, to my mind, seeing that there's methods for identifying risk is how, how can they be exploited to also identify mitigations for these risks? Okay, that's the creative bit. That's what human factors does for its bread and butter. So what we do, we, well, I suppose we have this belief that you identify the problem space, you identify what the troublesome issue is, and then the whole, you spent your entire human factors career dreaming up clever solutions to those problems. So let me say a bit of magic happens, um, and then you produce the solution. But we do have structured methods to help you get, to help you do that magic. My first slide was a bit tongue in cheek about a miracle, but, you know, if you know if you know what the problem space is, that's that's a that gives you at least a chance of coming up with a mitigation strategy. If you've got no idea what the problem space is, you haven't got a hope in hell. Mm. So, Katie will probably tell you we do have structured methods to try and help design those design those solutions, but it's a it's a miracle. All right, so that there are complementary methods that that help guide this process. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose there is a cost associated as well, right, with, with the mitigations. If, as you show, the, if the network is uh, um, has better connectivity, then the risk will be uh, lower or there won't be any risk if something well, fails. That's why cost. I think that's why it's important to do the model break model, because you don't know that these mitigation strategies will actually make it better until you test them. You've got no idea. It could make it worse. I mean, typically, you know, when you go in and there's been an, an accident or something, the, 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 the knee-jerk reaction is, let's put another check in the system. <laughs> which, uh, we, and then you get a system overburdened by checks, which themselves cause, further, cause more failures. So, you know, you have to be very careful about what you, what you recommend as a mitigation. Uh, thank you. Okay, so in the chat, um, Simos has asked whether EAST, you'd see EAST as complementing or replacing traditional safety analysis methods like HAZOP. I guess, uh, let, let, let me to, to explain what, what I mean by that, because, uh, I, so thanks for, first of all, for the uh, very interesting talk. So I was thinking that, because uh, you also, you already showed at the end in the, in the new book that you are also suggest using uh, a chapter for STPA. So do you, do you, in traditional safety, safety analysis, HAZOP does not work or has similar issues? For instance, it doesn't capture uh, multiple faults happening at the same time, but also is, has some nice, nice, uh, depend, allow, allows for some nice dependency analysis. So how, how do you see this working together to capture both safety, considerations and associate socio-technical considerations for these type of, types of systems? Yeah, um, I suppose my, the East was, was, a, was a reaction to the taxonomic, taxonomic approaches that are used in human factors. So human factors has a method called Sherpa, which is like a human um, HAZOP. So imagine, you know, you have those guide words in HAZOP, for looking at your technical system, but we have guide words for looking at human activities and saying what could go wrong. And in a way, I, I was, I wanted to, I, it was a kickback. I've used, and I've used these approaches myself, but it was a kind of kickback against those approaches which relied so much on human judgment to decide what would go wrong. Uh, and, and maybe a skilled analyst, in the hands of a skilled analyst who's, you know, seen everything just about they can probably be quite useful but you are relying on the skill of the analyst 
So I almost wanted to take the skill and the analyst out of the equation and say, you know, the providing your models reasonable, <laughs> given George Pentland's view that <laughs> no model is perfect. But if you say that this model is okay, it's acceptable, then we're not relying on some innate skill to say whether what goes wrong. We're just literally breaking every single link in uh, mechanistically and saying, if this information doesn't pass from this agent to, to this agent or from this task to this task, what happens to the system? So, I mean, we're not, so we're not using guide words. Having said all that, <laughs> I, I suspect uh, East plus the guide works, you know, would might perform equally as well. But I, it, I deliberately, I deliberately try to move away from that, you know, uh, innate skill based approach and try to make it more uh, black and white, I guess, more explicit. And I and I think the, it it well it makes sense because it goes back to what you said that. Well, if you have guide words, then you end up with a gazillion uh, entries in your spreadsheet, which mm -hmm. makes the analysis, and um, you can't do it. In, well, even unless in you unless you can make a machine do it, unless you can compute, you know, compute it, uh, you know. Okay, thank you. The, the interesting thing in that quite complex network we did of the uh, Hawk and the frigate uh, with the with the British Navy. The networks themselves are quite simple. We built them in a, you know, a couple of days. We and 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 breaking the links, you know, we didn't have to. We didn't do that many breaks, you know. The spreadsheets weren't that big, so I think you can do those high, very high level analyses using this sort of approach and probably pick up on maybe eighty percent of what goes wrong. And I think that's what they wanted. They they wanted to they 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 deliberately wanted to move away from the HAZOP approach, that was their goal. Okay, we'll go to Colin in the chat now. Uh, thanks, Neville. Um, just want to say, first of all, that um, your visual data visualizations were beautiful. I'm very um, envious uh, of those. Um, That's human factors for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, and so one of the things, and I think it follows on a little bit from that, but. Um, you, you showed some beautiful networks with um, tasks, for example, in there. And uh, the scientist in me was kind of going, how have you decided that's a task? And I think we've got humans in there and maybe they're pretty good at drawing boundaries around it. But as we move towards autonomous systems, is there anything, any, any lessons you've learned in what is an atomic task? You know, what is the unit we need to be working with here? Mm. OK, so the, the standard textbook response to that is it all depends on what you're doing. <laughs> so but for the first example I gave you, um, which was the, uh, the, the the submarine returning periscope depth. Yeah, we had a, a lot of detail there. Um, we had all the transcripts between all the different stations uh, in the in the control room and beyond, for the entire uh, you know uh, safe depth to periscope depth um, transitions, all of it. Um, and what I did there was I, um, with subject matter experts, grouped the discussions, the the, tra the communication transmissions, into tasks. So, you know, I said, okay, but they said, first of all, there's the outstation briefing. So, okay, which, which of these conversations belong to the outstation briefing? Thank you. Then there's the decision by the captain to go. He, get, he gets briefed by the officer watch. And then, so, and then he gives us the go decision. And then, okay, what are the, what then happens next? And so, and, you know, so you've got the watcher looking out for contacts. So there's a definite detect close contacts task. So you can look all the conversations. So you, what I'm trying to say is I could I could allocate each line of text, which is a, a conversation from one person to another, and I could allocate it discreetly against the text in a mutually exclusive and exhaustive way. Now, um, that's one way. So that was for that task. 
for the desktop workshop exercise, we agreed it was going to be pretty high level for this Hawk versus Frigate activity. We get this is going to be pretty high level. Mm -hmm. and, and what is high level? Well, I mean, I think if we're dealing with more than 20 tasks, it's, it, we're moving into the nitty gritty. So I've got a rule of thumb. <laughs> it says no more than 20. <laughs> so but that's, you know, I'm sure if it was 21, I wouldn't object. But you know what I mean? So we we agreed. So they and they had to be kind of like equivalent grouping of things to, to associate with the task. So I suppose in building those models, it does require a bit of everything I was trying to get away with in the tax armies. It does require a bit of tacit skill, you know, to, to build these things up. But then you have to go and show it to people and convince them. Other people have not been involved in the development of this, who are experts in this field, you know, people that fly, people are the duty holders and so on. That this is a representation of what they do and they have to sign that off. So I think the test is there. Can you convince other people who know the work that this is a reasonable explanation, reasonable description of what they do and that these links between these things actually exist? And did you feel that there was any coupling in there? So you're saying they're just number of tasks. Did it, was it also number of people involved in a task or amount of data transfer? Did that influence what you were talking about in terms of a, a, a unit? Because obviously one simple task could transfer vast amounts of important information, mm. uh, uh, but only involve one person, whereas mm. another task could involve 20 people making one fairly simple decision. Yeah. Um, I don't think we made that uh, at like an explicit um, uh, criterion for us. No, I don't think we did. Okay. Okay. Uh, Thank you. You, you, no. you, you would have probably been appalled to see, <laughs> see what we did. Oh, but, uh, no, no. I mean, this is just from my own uh, yeah. work in the past and people just draw boundaries around things and say that's a thing. And I'm always, you know, intrigued to see if you've drawn it slightly different, would all your outcomes have changed? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I mean, I think we passed that through enough people that we were convinced yeah. it was a reasonable description. You could have probably had a, had a well, I don't know, could you have, I don't, you could have had a different description, but it wouldn't have been wildly different, I don't think, given the very um, fixed nature of the work. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. flying an aircraft at 50 feet above the sea at a frigate. There's probably a limited number of ways you can do that. Yeah. There might yeah, be other yeah. work where you know there's a lot more discretion yeah thank I you suppose, i suppose that's the difference between very loosely coupled systems and very tightly coupled systems this was pretty tightly coupled if it, if it, you know if you asked um 10 university professors how they spent their day you'd probably get 10 very different answers so a very loosely coupled system it might be that might be harder to do so yeah. that 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 workshop approach probably only works well where you've got a very tightly coupled system like that Maybe. Great. Fascinating stuff. Thanks, Neville. All right. Cheers. Thanks for the questions. OK, uh, Poonam, and then there's one comment in the chat, and I think we'll probably be about time then. Uh, first of all, thank you, Neville, for giving a wonderful talk, because I am quite, I'm coming from very much technical stuff, and I never mm. kind of involved in socio-technical perspective of the systems. So it's kind of very interesting for me as well. So my question is, because I, I also look quite a lot on resilience, but more of more from a communication network perspective. And I think that is just a one part of the whole ecosystem which you are building. Mm. I'm just trying to figure out the test, where, where are you going to fit this old system when you are building the system, whether before some new system those are going to be deployed. We are going to use this model there, or it's already more systems are being deployed already, and we are going to test the resilience later on those systems. So quite, I'm quite intrigued, like where you think it will be fitting in future. If I've understood you correctly there, I, um, you, can, you can build a model of anything. It, the system doesn't have to exist. I, I think you could build these networks of systems that, only in your imagination or you're thinking about developing. Um, I, I think that's where human factors has the most benefit. You, you do it before you build the system. So I have no problem in, you know, you guys workshopping a system 
with these task information and social networks or how you think it might work, then looking at different versions of that system to see which might be more resilient. I think that would be an, an excellent way of using this method. Okay. Have I understood you correctly there? Is, is that yeah, so my, my, my question was like, we, we built, say, your model is very perfect, nearly perfect, you know. Now we would like to use this to verify the resilience of any already existing mm. systems. How is it we are going to use it to quantify a newly new system or is it we are start applying it to the already existing system and see how closely we um, I, think you do both. I think you could do both I don't I don't have a problem with either of those approaches so my question right uh, is like the other question is like it's hard to even define resilience what is resilience because every system have their own uh, unit you know the the definition of resilience for a one system. Uh, the way I perceive resilience is that every system should be built robust. If a system is 100% robust, it is 100% resilience. It should be 100% resilient as well. But because systems are not 100% robust, there is a part of that when the system fails, the resilience is another a kind of um, property of the system, how quickly it will come and uh, allows the whole system to work, still work, not at some level of fault tolerance and graceful degradation. That's a kind of a property, kind of a loosely coupled with it. Um, but in different systems, I think it's a different. Yeah, I'd say from a, it's coming from my perspective, I'd want to build a system that's adaptable um, because um, inevitably things change. And I think a non-resilient system is one that fails to adapt. So, um, you know, because the, the situations change and if you don't adapt, uh, you fail, you become brittle. Uh, I think brittle is one of the sort of socio-technical system words people like to use. Brittle systems don't adapt because they're not flexible uh, and, and then they fail. So you want a flexible, adaptable system. That, that's a, that for me would be metrics of resilience. No, uh, that's... Uh perfectly makes sense to me. But now again, the follow up question is like how we measure after basically, if we, we find, you know, system is adapting, and then there will be a, some feedback loop going back to the system, which makes it adaptable, then we test and that's I think you already answered me my that question in previously that we don't know yet, whether that new changes, which we thought make system more resilient may not be making the system more resilient until we test that. Yeah, so, so dynamical models yeah. presumably would be the way to go for that, testing okay. that, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering my old questions and- As best as I could anyway. Thank you. Okay. Jane, do you want to comment on your comment or are you happy it's in, just in the chat to read? Yeah, I, I, I can explain a little bit more. I, I, I couldn't get a grip, I'm afraid, on the- um, um, the, the metrics you're using, how much confidence and trust played a role in, in um, some of the metrics that you were using. So for, for me, that there, there's an issue about, um, well, I'm sure you'll have found it with working with the military. Um, they either 100% trust the information they receive or they 100% um, think it's completely wrong. And the, the, there's not much room for manoeuvre in between, but some of the things that we found um, for example, when we looked at some of the complex networks that were all point connected is that we'd have data going through different routes and coming back to a human and the human or the system could see two different bits of information um, and think they were independent information corroborating each other and therefore they would trust that information more, even though that, that it was the same piece of information, which is when we put a requirement in for metadata. But it, it occurs to me that that, that is something that you would need to factor in if you're using the interaction between humans and machines to make um, inferences that the, the believability and the confidence in the data probably ought to pay, play some kind of role in there. Yeah, sure. But it's not something I was looking at today. Um, my experience of working with the Royal Navy is that they, all that data they get in submarines, because you're blind, effectively you've just got um, passive uh, sonar receptors mm. to tell you, you're just listening to noise on a bearing, that's all you've got. 
they take everything as an estimate until they actually visually sight it when the periscope goes up. So they don't really hold it as truth. They just say, well, there's something in that vicinity. We think it's this based on its behavior and how much noise it's emitting and how many propellers we think it's got and so on. So they, they do treat it with a bit of skepticism. They don't treat it as ground truth until they actually pop the, the uh, well, it's an optronics mass now, not a periscope, but uh, pop that pops up and, and they can see it and take uh, a, a reading directly off it. And then they know it's truth and then they replot their tactical displays. It may, maybe it's just the pilots then that, uh, who, who I have more experience working with, who, who mm -hmm. just take everything as, as either they are confident in the system and believe everything the system tells them, or they are not percent confident in it and, and fail to believe anything that it tells mm -hmm. them. But, uh, but, but yeah, I, I, I think. I, I certainly wasn't offering this as, a, as an insight into trust at all. I was offering it as an insight into uh, ne a network approach to looking at uh, resilience. That's all I was trying to do. Yeah, no, I, I was just thinking that, that some of the, the links that you made in there and say you were cutting the links, you wouldn't actually necessarily be cutting them completely. You might just be reducing, significantly reducing the confidence that, that the human has in trusting that link. Um, yeah whether that could be figured in. But I hadn't thought of it like that, but that's, that's one way you could interpret it, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Great, I think in the interest of it being just after four, we should uh, wrap up there, but thank you, Neville. It um, obviously generated lots of uh, discussion and it was great to have human factors represented at one of these seminars. So thank you um, everyone for attending and Neville for speaking. Um,